Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Brett Ryder, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 1977 science fiction blockbuster titled Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Now this movie runs for 2 hours and 15 minutes long, depends on if you're looking at the original cut. If you're looking at the director's cut, it's probably boosted up to an hour and seven two hours and 17 minutes long or if you're looking at the special edition cut you're probably looking at two hours and 12 minutes long it is written and directed by Steven Spielberg it is produced by Julia and Michael Phillips the score was done by legendary composer John Williams the cinematography was done by Vilmos Zig Mond, and the editing was done by Michael Kahn. And the stars of the movie are Richard Dreyfuss, uh, François Truffaut, Melinda Dillon, Terry Gar, Carrie Guffey, Bob Balaban, Joseph Summer, Lance Henriksen, and Roberts Blossom. So, shortly after the success of his 1975 blockbuster hit, Jaws, Steven Spielberg continued to churn out another big-budgeted popcorn film with his next big hit, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. For many years, the sci-fi film has remained very horrifically suspenseful, while the technical features were very inspiring. So definitely without spoon feeding us, Spielberg took us on a journey with unpredictable consequences. And before watching the film, we never knew what kind of a sci-fi film was coming our way. Was it going to be a sci-fi with the whole action cliche of, you know, little green men trying to take over the earth and want to start some kind of some kind of warfare and it's us humans taking on the more supremely intelligent aliens or were we going to get something a little more insightful and maybe something a little more uh, philosophical with some provocative intentions manifested within the script what was it going to be? Well, without spoon feeding us, Spielberg took us on a journey with unpredictable consequences. Before watching this film, we never know what kind of sci fi film is coming our way. From the very start, it appears that Jillian Guller, Guiler, played by Melinda Dillon, has a fear of these alien beings, partially because she's raising a young son named Barry, played by Carrie Guffey, on her own. And she's got every right to be frightened. I mean, there's it's unknown about the whereabouts of her husband. It's unknown as to whether her husband is divorced or if he has passed on. But she does seem to inject that kind of fear that she maybe not necessarily be of the aliens, but maybe mostly because of the fear of losing another loved one who she loves truly and dearly, and that is her son, Barry. She doesn't want to lose him. And she feels that with him being abducted by these aliens, she's got all kinds of fears. And who could blame her? You never know what these aliens are doing. They could be engaging in some kind of weird experimentations. Well, some of the early scenes take place in the Gobi deserts of Mongolia, where we see, uh, where we see old, authentic World War II helicopters and aircraft uh, apparatuses located in the desert and instead of rust 
they still seem to remain in pristine, immaculate condition. Then we have some other um, apparatuses found in other outskirts of the planet. Old, archaic apparatuses that should be supported by rust, but they're still just as good as new. And how did it move from one place to another to another place? How did it move from one part of the world to another? I mean, it could be some kind of some kind of relic, some kind of artifact that's been locked up in a Smithsonian. And the next thing you know, it's located in the Gobi Desert. And it often leads to some kind of weird suspicions. What kind of force would do such a thing? And it leads us to a lot of these questions. These questions go along as this film rolls. Meanwhile, back in Indiana, we have Roy Neary, played by Richard Dreyfus. He has the fortunate obsession with these alien visitors due to the fact that he's seldom ever home. And who can blame him? Richard Dreyfus is an everyday, hard-working, blue-collar guy who installs telephone wires. He's, all, he's an electrical lineman. He's blue collar. He's not a scientist. He's not. He doesn't have tons of astronomical degrees or any kind of science. He's a blue collar guy who goes up and fixes your cable wires. But he's hardly ever home. And the reason for his hardly ever home is either because he's always on call. You know, in case of a power outage, he's on call. And then one time, one day when he was working on some power lines, he sees this strange anomaly floating in the sky. And this strange anomaly leads his curiosities into an unhealthy, full-blown obsession. And this obsession is much to the chagrin of his wife and his three kids. And the more and more he becomes obsessed with what he saw, the more and more he drifts away from his family. And that his family doesn't want anything to do with him. So the wife, played by Terry Gar, packs up her things, takes her children, and stays at her sister's. I mean, his obsession with this spacecraft, not only that, has led him to becoming fired from his job and he just does not have really much things going for him except for the fact that he is obsessed with whatever was out there And it leads him to going to some mysterious place called Devil's Tower. Where it's most likely that he will likely get the answers to all of his questions. I mean, his obsessions go as so far as to build some kind of a dia diagram or diaphragm of 
what it is he saw. I mean, he would take a big glob of shaving cream and would start building a design out of it. He would take his mashed potatoes and he would pile it on his plate to create some kind of an image. Or then he would go into people's scrapyards and make himself a model tower of what it is that he saw. And all of this makes the entire town think he's a weirdo. His children, his wife thinks he's insane. And they just get literally driven away by him. All the while, he is obsessed with whatever it is that he's obsessed with. Now, a lot of people are often wondering what is so nifty about the about the special edition. Well, the special edition gets, you know, a little bit more involved with Roy Neary's dysfunctional family. Because it seems like the entire clan seems to be bickering with each other. It was omitted from the original cut. It kind of gave us kind of like a clear picture of just how Roy's fixation was fracturing his family life and how a personal experience was esoterically placed in the film. According to Steven Spielberg's siblings, they can actually relate to the trauma they had growing up when their parents would bicker, which inevitably led to, to their divorce. So there was a lot of experience factor that comes into this. And it seems to come into a lot of that in a lot of his movies. I mean, the whole dysfunctional family scenario is a trademark, which is something that Spielberg continually reflects back on. And sure, this movie is not as coherent as Jaws. It's still a good personal film of Spielberg's. Um, a lot of people often wonder, why is it that he wrote his own script for this movie? Was it because of personal experience? Partially. But it was because there was some other previous scripts that was given to him. But it just didn't really meet his criteria. And one of the ones I'm glad that he omitted. That he turned down was Paul Schrader's script. Where he would have Roy playing sort of like a reclusive stoner. Who goes on some kind of spiritual journey. To encounter the aliens. Almost like a hypnosis type of thing. Sure it might probably have some. Insightful makings. Of a lame brain popcorn music movie. But for the reason why this film. Aged well 40 years. Is simply because Roy. Is just a typical average citizen. Operating on cable wires. And that everyone could probably relate to him. He is that much of a relatable character. I'm sure you probably would have met an average Smo with a fixation of something just like Roy Neary was in this movie. The thing that really stood out for me in this film was definitely the climax at the end of the scene with the encounter of the aliens. The setup for their arrival stayed intrigued the whole the way through you know with the with the people in India doing the same repetitive chant and the whole musical note that sounds like something that was taken from a Simon game you remember Simon huh you know where the lights flash and you have to try to yeah one of the earliest electronic games well, anyhow, 
it had that similar type of do 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 repeat it and you know that's kind of like what the setup was and and you know the thing that led to the aliens you know Roy drifting away from his family his trip to Devil's Tower Wyoming till finally he sees the real thing from his model he actually sees what it what the, the actual model is it was Devil's Tower and he saw it firsthand and I think he was just purely blown away by it and he did it to such great effect and the whole climax that led to the arrival of the aliens was definitely well executed and it came with a good story to go along the aliens here are portrayed as benign with even one grimacing at Lecombe played by Francois Truffaut and I'm glad to see that we are looking at benign aliens rather than these hostile war hungry creatures that we've been fed to in the golden age of cinema. The beings are definitely portrayed like in the pop culture format, you know, with the huge head and the big dark eyes and the little motionless mouths. So when the humans make a connection with the aliens via musical sounds, it's it's hard to decipher still the communication comes into place which is both haunting and at the same time magical so most people here complained about the aliens looking unoriginal and mundane so what were you expecting little green men these are the manifestations that patients have described to therapists who have claimed to have been in contact with. They all seem to sort of have that kind of appearance. The big head, the dark eyes, the stoic mouths. This is all just something that people have had when they visualize alien encounters. Sure, they would look more differently if it was filmed today. And while the design truly inspired Spielberg through the old alien invasions flicks back in the 50s, the conventional 1970s look made it look all the more realistic. Now, whether you've actually had an alien encounter or not, these are what many patients, psychiatric, psychological patients, have had contact with. When they go into their hypnosis, they give a physical description of what these alien creatures look like. And this is something that you would likely see in this, in this movie. You know, like back in 1947 when a flying saucer landed in Roswell, New Mexico and they had a being in there. These kids look just like the being inside that flying saucer. It's pretty realistic and I'm glad they didn't go as too far off as to over exaggerate with the makeup and the calisthenics or things like that. The events that led to the encounter was very climactic and suspenseful. First we see the flying saucer open and human captives 
who have been captured for since the 1940s or 50s who were reported missing in action. They've come back and they haven't aged at all. Barry also is reunited with his mother. Then we see a praying mantis come out. And a dog. And they will finally, at long last, the aliens. Who seem to be somewhat responded to a certain, to a certain musical note. And these scientists try their best and everything to communicate with them through music. Because according to this movie, music is the universal language. And I think that's what kind of was like the, the running theme message that was going on throughout this movie. Sure, they definitely make a grand, grand introduction. Even if their design wasn't that outrageous. But who needs it to be outrageous? I'd rather see something more believable rather than outrageous. And here, even though this movie does take itself a little too serious for its good, it was good that they added something that wasn't too vibrant. They kept it subtle. And I give a lot of praise for that. The special effects were really, truly remarkable here. The moment when Lacombe gives the musical gesture to one of the aliens and the smile on Truffaut's face is absolutely poetic. It's not a shocker that well-known French director Jean Reno, right before his death, actually praised the film immensely, let alone Spielberg as a direction and went as far as to give him an open letter of congrats. He claimed he enjoyed the film and felt bad that it wasn't filmed in France and that Truffaut was a fada, which means possessed by fairies. And yeah, you know, hey, this was definitely truly one of Steven Spielberg's earlier films you know he was still kinda of relatively new in the game but he was quickly making a name for himself I mean he made a name for himself in the Oscar winning movie Jaws but here in Close Encounters of the Third Kind we actually see Steven Spielberg truly has a remarkable fixation for science fiction and he wanted to kind of modernize the science fiction to make it seem more serious and more focused as opposed to being a campy, war-torn, epic fight battles type of movie. So I give a lot of praise and credit for Steven Spielberg and his contribution to this movie. Uh, if you didn't see Close Encounters of the Third Kind... Well, I'm sure it's probably out there, the video store, or you can go on Netflix, or you can even check online to see if it's there. I'm sure it'll be likely there, and I'm sure you will definitely have one hell of an enjoyable, thought-provoking ride. It's not a popcorn movie. There is a lot of serious, philosophical elements that comes with this movie. And even though it may sound surreal... It actually does have you thinking. So if I was to give a, a, a point score out of 10, I would definitely give Close Encounters of the Third Kind an 8. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. Just remember, be kind, be courteous, and don't be rude. And I'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Ryder saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.